I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. Remember last year when Obama tried to bomb Syria without congressional or UN approval, but was stonewalled by enormous public pressure? Well, the empire never lets a little thing like public opinion get in its way, which is why it turned to another tactic to get people on board with yet another illegal war. Scare the hell out of everyone. See, for weeks, the corporate media was fear-mongering us about the threat of ISIS to establish a global Islamic caliphate. But once intelligence officials and even Obama himself admitted that this extremist group actually posed no imminent threat to the U.S., they had to think of something else. Enter the Khorasan Group, an organization comprised of veteran al-Qaeda fighters and jihadis from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Europe that allegedly traveled to Syria to link up with al-Nusra. According to an AP report on September 13th, the group, quote, poses a more direct and imminent threat to the U.S., working with Yemeni bomb makers to target aviation, American officials say. According to classified U.S. intelligence assessments, the Khorasan militants have been working with bomb makers from al-Qaeda's Yemen affiliate to test new ways to slip explosives past airport security. Oh my God, a new terrorist group that actually does pose a threat to the U.S. and could be boarding airliners with toothpaste explosives at any minute. Yes, that narrative was picked up by almost every establishment journo across the corporate media who seemed giddy to have gotten such a scoop from anonymous government officials. One small problem, though, the group was entirely concocted by the government. <laughs> According to Glenn Greenwald and Murtasa Hussein of The Intercept, the Corson group doesn't really exist. In fact, a Nexus search shows almost no mention of the name before that AP report. Former terrorism federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy is also calling out the scam, writing, you haven't heard of the Coruscant group because there isn't one. It's a name the administration came up with, calculating that Coruscant had sufficient connection to jihadist lore that no one would call the president on. He's right. No one did. Instead, D.C. journals were eager to become pawns to regurgitate the carefully crafted propaganda. And here we are, our Nobel Peace Prize winning president, now embroiled in his seventh war against a Muslim country. New York Times journalist James Risen said it best when he tweeted, the Coruscant group is kind of like the Kardashian group. They became famous even though they've never really done anything. Apparently, that's what the war on terror has become. Life imitating reality television. Now let's break the set. Speculation has been replacing hard fact. Terrorists don't read Twitter. Who's right and who's wrong? It was a terrible thing to say, period. For the sake, entirely on me. What we need is to question more and to keep it uncensored, real and raw. These words are hard hitting, you're watching your neck, but you need to tune in because we're going to get it said. To outsiders, China may appear to be a strongly cohesive country with intense nationalist pride and a population devoted to the central government and Communist Party. And outside of the Tiananmen Square protests and subsequent massacre by Chinese troops in 1989, few Westerners can point to modern-day examples of mass defiance in the nation. But of course, despite the constant projections of the unbreakable unity by the Chinese government, societal fractures and major differences in governing philosophies exist everywhere, from the Uyghur territory in northwest China to the disputed island of Taiwan. But perhaps no area of the country has a more fractious relationship with Beijing than the autonomous region of Hong Kong. See, modern-day Hong Kong is largely the product of empire, with 155 years of British rule governing the city and surrounding areas. And for better or for worse, over the last two centuries, the influence of the United Kingdom has extended into many facets of Hong Kong society, from its educational system to its court system, creating a unique hybrid region made up of both Eastern and Western customs and culture. As a result, Hong Kong officials have rarely been on the same page with policymakers in Beijing. This was apparent even in the 60s and 70s, when refugees from mainland China escaping Chairman Mao's cultural revolution were accepted as refugees in the city. And when the UK headed over control, handed over control of Hong Kong to China in 1997, it was under the idea of, quote, one country, two systems, a notion that Hong Kong residents interpreted as full autonomy over internal government issues. 
In fact, in order to quell concerns over the mainland's takeover of the region, China's top official on Hong Kong affairs said in 1993 that, quote, how Hong Kong develops its democracy in the future is completely within the sphere of the autonomy of Hong Kong. The central government will not interfere. Except over the years, this promise has been repeatedly broken. Look no further than this past June, when China released a white paper which asserted the central government's authority over Hong Kong. In response, nearly half a million Hong Kongers took to the streets in a peaceful march. Then came another decree from Beijing dealing a crushing blow to the region's pro-democracy movement. The central government ruled that while the region can directly elect its leaders, only three candidates can run for Hong Kong's highest office. And all candidates must first be approved by leaders in Beijing. Fast forward to today, where we're seeing the results of that declaration come to fruition. Downtown Hong Kong has largely become a war zone, as tens of thousands of people furious with mainland China have taken to the streets in support of real democracy. And for a city that has largely remained stable and peaceful throughout the decades, the scenes emerging out of Hong Kong are truly stunning. These mass demonstrations have been met with tear gas, rubber bullets, and an all-out force by riot police. But amazingly, instead of stifling the protests, the police response has only emboldened them, leading to thousands more joining in, shutting down major streets in the process. And in an ode to Occupy Wall Street, the protests are being led by a group called Occupy Central. It's largely made up of thousands of teenagers and 20-somethings, many of whom are students refusing to attend classes until their demands are met. And it's no surprise that the youth are at the forefront. The unemployment rate in this city among young people is more than double the regional average, and the jobs that are available pay measly salaries. In fact, Hong Kong had no minimum wage until 2010 and currently stands at a pathetic $3.86 an hour in the second most expensive city on the planet. Think about that. And when you realize that Hong Kong has one of the most unequal economies in the world and there are no collective bargaining rights, it becomes quite clear why young people want to directly elect their own representatives. And there's no doubt that despite their youth, these protesters are terrifying Beijing. The images and videos of these protests have largely been kept off the airwaves in mainland China. In their place, one state-controlled broadcaster called Dragon TV reported that civil society groups gathered in a Hong Kong park to voice their support for the central government's decisions. There are also reports that the photo-sharing app Instagram has been blocked by the Great Firewall of China on the mainland, demonstrating the government's fears that this movement could spark similar demonstrations in other areas of the country. But no matter what silencing tactics authority figures use to prevent the growth of this movement, it's clear that as China's role in the world becomes more and more prominent, the government has some serious questions to answer about what kind of society it wants to be. One that stands for human rights, freedom of expression, and the will of the people, or one that perpetuates violence, censorship, and authoritarianism. The 2008 bank bailout in the wake of the financial crisis was necessary, we were told, to prevent a large economic collapse in America. Not only has that proven to be false, but now, six years later, proof has emerged that the Federal Reserve played an integral role in the handling of the crisis in order to benefit its Wall Street buds. See, the Federal Reserve has both public and private elements, but it plays itself off as being a neutral regulatory body, intermediating between the government and the financial sector. But that myth has been officially debunked, thanks in part to Fed whistleblower Carmen Segarra, who secretly recorded over 48 hours of conversations between top New York Fed employees in 2012. The explosive report, published by ProPublica and NPR, lays bare an agency that does little more than act as a conduit to Wall Street, which spent billions to protect and provide immunity to the very people at the helm of the financial collapse. Sagara was also appointed in late 2001 as chief examiner of Goldman Sachs, but was promptly fired after only seven months, ostensibly after pissing off the Fed and Goldman with her findings, leading her to sue the New York Federal Reserve after Goldman Sachs tried to shut her up with a settlement of $7 million. 
The lawsuit was thrown out, but she came out with the story anyway. So to talk more about these revelations, I'm joined now by Erin Aid, host of RT's financial show, Boom Bust. Amazing to have you on again, Erin. Hello, it's good to be I'm here. So I'm so happy good you're to talk on. about this. Yes, I, so talk about what these tapes expose that we didn't already know. The sad answer, Abby, is nothing. <laughs> we kind of knew that <laughs> Goldman and the Fed had a really cozy relationship, and they did, in fact. But the biggest revelation has to do with Santander and then another deal um, that, that dealt with El Paso Corporation and Kinder Morgan, which are both big energy companies. But the Santander one is a big one. And long story short, the Santander, they had certain capital requirements that were obviously required by the European regulatory bodies there. They couldn't meet them. They were working with Goldman. Goldman said, we'll take some of the money off of your books. We'll hold it for a while. We'll give it back to you. This will all blow over. Well, Carmen saw this, said, no, 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 not really. You know, this is, this is a gray area. And actually, her, her boss, her senior uh, person from the Fed based within Goldman, said himself, you know, this is a, I have the quote right here, it's actually spectacular, this is a legally gray area. <laughs> like he knew, he was like, this is okay, but wow. you know, we don't want to piss off Goldman, these are our friends, so let's just go in there soft, we, want, we don't want to discourage them from telling us stuff like this. So long story short, she said, that's not the truth. We're not doing anything. Nothing's going forward. And she got let go as a result. Well, that's unbelievable. Yeah, she was trying to say, we need, we need some major overhaul yes. here. And, and, you know, as you just said, didn't really expose things that we didn't know. True that. Because right. you yeah, had Fed right. President kind of William Dudley's a former Goldman Sachs partner. Yeah. So, oh, the, he's yeah, just one of many. You, the, you know, the whole New York Fed is kind of made up of Goldman or ex-Goldman. It's this revolving door. But, you know, we say it's Washington to Wall Street. It's just down the block on Wall Street to the New York Fed at the totally. end of Pine. It's unbelievable. Is this indicative of the larger Federal Reserve? You want to know something? I would say no to that, only really? because, you know, this was a conflict of interest examination that Carmen was staffed on. And, and these banks are set up to, to judge too big to fail banks. So you have, which ones do we have here? We have Goldman, JP Morgan, Chase, Deutsche Bank, Barclays. They're in New York. So the Cincinnati Fed, not, you know, yes, they obviously are involved and it's all a revolving door and those in, in power get, get away with stuff. But I would say that the New York Fed is more fraudulent in their actions than, say, you know, the Cincinnati. I'm just wondering if the, if the Federal Reserve as a whole, though, I mean, they had to know about this stuff and they're just turning yes. a blind eye or they're kind of yes. allowing this and to you happen. Know what, you know, Abby, it's not necessarily like these guys are defrauding anyone so much as they're just, you know, turning, turning their cheek. Right. These are their buddies. They, they actually work. So it's kind of like consulting where they're staffed at Goldman. So they're in the Goldman buildings. They're with other Goldman executives. They don't want to get their buddies in trouble. It's and disgusting. It's, it no. is disgusting. No, they're set up to regulate. I'm not defending <laughs> no, this. No, no, I know. It's criminal. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that's, that's it's the like, truth. It's like legal on paper, right? Yes, I mean, it's like precisely. The, it, it's a legal gray area, right. as Silver would tell us. As she would say. <laughs> well, we know Elizabeth Warren, of course, one of the most vocal mm -hmm. um, you know, representatives out there kind of calling for reform on Wall Street. She's calling for an investigation. What's going to happen here? Do you do you think that any sort Honestly, of reform is actually I mean, going to come out of this? Like blind optimism, I would hope so. I really, <laughs> reality, no, I don't think anything will come out of it. I think that Elizabeth Warren, while I do respect all of the things that she's done, and, and she has been a huge proponent of regulation, you know, the reason Carmen was put in place, the Fed has acknowledged that they need massive reforms and that they need more regulation coming out and, and going on, yet they're firing the people actually employing the regulation they insist upon. So as much as I would like to say that Elizabeth Warren will make a difference, I don't think she will. Well, it's a total mess. Uh, thanks for coming out and breaking Thank it you, down, Erin. Of course. Amazing Good to have you on. Thanks so much. Coming up, I'll talk about why a settlement between a Native American nation and the government isn't all it's cracked out to be. Stay tuned. Are you like me? Do you want your comedy news with some teeth? Want your comedy news to be a bare-fisted, no-holds-barred fight to the death? Like a truth vampire biting into the necks of the corporate elite and the billionaire freaks while they're going, ah, ah, make it stop! Well, that's what you get with my new show, Redacted Tonight. Is that too much? I, 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 think, I think that was too much. I know CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News have taken some knocks lately, but the fact is I admire their commitment to cover all sides of a story just in case one of them happens to be accurate. <laughs> that was funny, but it's closer to the truth than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> because when politicians and the mainstream media work side by side, the joke is actually on you. <laughs> At RT News, we have a different approach. 
L-O-L. Because the news of the world just is not this funny. I'm not laughing, damn it, I'm not laughing! <laughs> 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 you guys stick to the jokes, we'll handle the news. <laughs>
United Nations 69th General Assembly comes to a close this week. And while we missed Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's cartoon bomb chart this year, he nonetheless captured the world's attention with an impassioned speech defending Israel's actions in Gaza. As Israel surgically struck at the rocket launchers and at the tunnels, Palestinian civilians were tragically but unintentionally killed. There are heart-rending images that resulted, and these fueled libelous charges that Israel was deliberately targeting civilians. We were not. We deeply regret every single civilian casualties. No other country and no other army in history have gone to greater lengths to avoid casualties among the civilian population of their enemies. Interestingly enough, while Netanyahu denies complicity in war, crime, war crimes, excuse me, just last week, an independent tribunal in Brussels found the Israeli military culpable of a laundry list of war crimes. Among them, intentional targeting of civilians, the disproportionate use of force, and the use of violence to spread terror among civilians. With the corporate media only highlighting Netanyahu and Obama's speeches, most of the discourse at the UNGA has been largely overlooked. So to help me break down some of the most important speeches that you might have missed, I'm joined by breaking the set producer, Manuel Rapolo, expert of UNGA relations. UN correspondent. <laughs> so that made me sick. Um, but let's talk about Iran, because Western relations in Iran seem to be completely off the radar. Um, I know that, you know, there were some meetings between Rouhani, the UK. It's very unclear what's going to happen out of that, but Rouhani did say at the UN that, quote, certain intelligence agencies have put blades in the hands of madmen who spare no one. The right solution to this quandary comes from within the region and regionally provided solution with international support and not from outside the region. Basically stressing, let us fix our own problems here. I mean, what do you take? Right. Uh, well, before we get into the quote, uh, I think that there have been uh, sort of olive branches since Rouhani took office in, in Iran. Last year, we saw that phone call with Obama. This year, we're seeing, uh, for the first time since 1979, like you mentioned, the UK government and the Iranian government having talks in the same room. That's, that's historic. So there is headway being made in terms of better negotiations, better relations with Iran. But I think that uh, there's a lot of politics that come into play, perception. And that's true not only for the Obama administration, but also for uh, Rouhani going back to, to Iran. Um, getting into the international politics of it becomes even more complicated because even though, like you mentioned, there is that common threat with ISIS and Iran saying, let us handle it, there isn't a lot of uh, agreement even, even among Arab leaders as to how, how to deal with ISIS. And in terms of working with the United States and working with the UK as a sort of partnership, as long as Western powers are, are backing uh, kind of moderate rebel forces in Syria and Iran is backing the Assad regime in Syria, we're not going to see any short-term or long-term uh, cooperation for that matter. Um, so I, I really don't see this being anything um, beyond sort of sidelines diplomacy right now in, in terms of better relations. Yeah, good point. And of course, several wor world leaders, this is nothing new, are calling, uh, calling out the Security Council. Um, specifically, Bolivian President Eva Morales, who spoke to RT exclusively about the issue. Let's uh, hear that. Honduran territories today is one of the battlefields of a war which is not our own. We did not begin this war. I don't believe in the Security Council. For me, the Security Council continues to be a council of insecurity for humanity. The Security Council, to me, is nothing more than an instrument for the organization of the United Nations, one that has the most autonomy to make decisions. First clip was the Honduran president talking about the drug war, which we'll hear later. But let's talk about why this body is so controversial and who else expressed concern over it. Right, because it's not just Bolivia, it's not just Argentina or the non-nuclear countries that are opposing and calling for a reform of uh, of the Security Council. It's the G4 countries: India, Brazil, um, Germany, Japan. These countries are all calling for reform, uh, and it's for a variety of reasons. It's, it mainly comes down to membership: the fact that there's five permanent members. Countries are calling for there to be more membership. Other countries are calling to have the permanent membership completely abolished. Aside from that is the veto powers. These five countries, uh, France, Russia, the United States, China, uh, they have veto power over, over any resolution that goes through the Security Council. Consider that a Harvard working paper in, uh, has pointed to the fact that since 1982, there have been at least 32 resolutions critical of Israel that have been vetoed by the United States. That's twice as many vetoes as any other member state has ever done. And this is a valid criticism, I think, for any member. Uh, Russia 
Russia, for example, uh, vetoed a resolution uh, that would have brought some sort of di um, diplomatic resolution to Syria earlier this month. So this is certainly a very problematic um, aspect of the Security Council. And aside from that, there's also the, the fait accompli, which is, um, you know, the fact that these uh, Western leaders that are represented at the Security Council kind of have closed door negotiations and then, then present them before the body and say, all right, now we're going to vote without deliberating on it. Well, what's the point of having this world body if, if like, the U.S. can just veto every single resolution when it comes to Israel? It's right. almost just like, how can you and move that forward many over on the that course issue? of history? It's right. right. Oh, my gosh. Um, let's talk about the NSA because, of course, uh, last year we know Rousseff went off and this year she did also. I wanted to read a quote about, um, and, and of course, we're talking about the U U.S. spying on foreign leaders. Specifically, um, she says meddling in such a manner in the lives and affairs of other countries is a breach of international law. Ouch! And as such, is an affront to the principles that should otherwise govern relations among countries, especially among friendly nations. What other diplomatic blowback have we seen from this leak? I think it's been widespread, and I think that the the talk about ISIS with ISIS, Ebola, uh, Ukraine, Syria. Um, Iraq. This is all kind of uh, distracted, distracted from from the NSA scandal. But last year, this this was huge, and I think it's important that the Brazilian delegation, the, uh, the Brazilian president, is highlighting it once again, so that we don't forget that even though uh, this is sort of being brushed aside, this is very much still a tense topic. Germany, we've known, uh, have been pissed off about this since last year, but they're not trying to rock the boat. Uh, diplomatic ties are stretched with with Russia. They're stretched with with Brazil, with Ecuador, and a whole host of other countries, including Afghanistan. We've seen the, pres the outgoing president of Afghanistan, Karzai, uh, kind of uh, thank everybody but the United States <laughs> as, he's, as he's leaving office. And that, that's part of that kind of uh, NSA sweep, that whole scandal from last year. It's still very relevant today, I think. Uh, and let's hear that, that clip that we, we started to hear, um, the Honduran president talking about the drug war, another issue that's totally swept under the rug. Honduran territories today is one of the battlefields of a war which is not our own. We did not begin this war. The strategies are decided upon outside Honduras. We cannot uh, allow that in the midst of the crisis, without reaching useful solid conclusions, a proposal based on the one hand on legalizing production and on the other, uh, making traffic and consumption of the drugs illegal. And these are based on uh, waging an all-out war on all fronts, no matter what the cost. Manny, you're Honduran. You've been covering this issue, of course, for years. Talk about what exactly he's calling for uh, to solve the drug war. Right. I think ultimately, this is one of the most important uh, speeches uh, that I think was overlooked. This is a call for visibility, to acknowledge that the drug war, the humanitarian crisis in Central America is just as important as any refugee crisis going on in the Middle East or elsewhere in the world. And so. Um, What's different about this and what the Honduran president was outlining, the presidents of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador were outlining at the UNGA, is that this is different because the humanitarian crisis is now right here at the doorstep of the United States. By the year's end, we're going to have 90,000 undocumented uh, migrant children, refugees coming into the United States. This is very much a problem uh, of U.S. policy. And the fact of the matter is that with Honduras now being the murder capital of the world, Central America being so unstable, it all ties back to U.S. policy, and that's something that needs to change. Right, and I think the biggest point is that we didn't hear about any of these people on the mainstream media. All we heard about was Obama's speech, Netanyahu's speech. All these people were condemning the U.S. for its policies, and that's why we're highlighting them today, because all these world leaders are equally as important. Thank you so much, Manny, thanks for so covering much. it. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching, you guys. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, at Abby Martin. Join me tomorrow when I break the set all over again. Life imitating reality television. Now let's break the set. Speculation has been replacing hard fact. The terrorists don't read Twitter. Who's right and who's wrong? It was a terrible thing to say, period. For the say entirely on me. What we need is to question more and to keep it uncensored, real and raw. These words are hard hitting, you're watching your neck, but you need to tune in because we're right, 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 set. To outsiders, China may appear to be a strongly cohesive officials, and even Obama himself admitted that this extremist group actually posed no imminent threat to the U.S. They had to think of something else. 
enter the Khorasan group. An organization comprised of veteran al-Qaeda fighters and jihadis from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Europe that allegedly traveled to Syria to link up with al-Nusra. According to an AP report on September 13th, the group, quote, poses a more direct and imminent threat to the U.S., working with Yemeni bomb makers to target aviation, American officials say. According to classified U.S. intelligence assessments, the Khorasan militants have been working with bomb makers from al-Qaeda's Yemen affiliate to test new ways to slip explosives past airport security because there isn't one. It's a name the administration came up with, calculating that Khorasan had sufficient connection to jihadist lore that no one would call the president on. He's right. No one did. Instead, D.C. journals were eager to become pawns to regurgitate the carefully crafted propaganda. And here we are, our Nobel Peace Prize winning president, now embroiled in his seventh war against a Muslim country. New York Times journalist James Risen said it best when he tweeted the Corson group is kind of like the Kardashian group. They became famous even though they've never really done anything. Apparently that's what the war on terror has become. everyone, I'm Abby Martin and this is Breaking the Set. Remember last year when Obama tried to bomb Syria without congressional or UN approval but was stonewalled by enormous public pressure? Well, the empire never lets a little thing like public opinion get in its way, which is why it turned to another tactic to get people on board with yet another illegal war. Scare the hell out of everyone. See, for weeks, the corporate media was fear-mongering us about the threat of ISIS to establish a global Islamic caliphate. But once intelligence officials... Oh, my God, a new terrorist group that actually does pose a threat to the U.S. and could be boarding airliners with toothpaste explosives at any minute. Yes, that narrative was picked up by almost every establishment journo across the corporate media who seemed giddy to have gotten such a scoop from anonymous government officials. One small problem, though, the group was entirely concocted by the government. <laughs> According to Glenn Greenwald and Murtasa Hussein of The Intercept, the Corson group doesn't really exist. In fact, a Nexus search shows almost no mention of the name before that AP report. Former terrorism federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy is also calling out the scam, writing, you haven't heard of the Corson group